How do you do? This episode deals with two of the greatest mysteries of creation, life and death. It may thrill you, it may shock you, it might even horrify you, but well, you have been warned. Deze week gaan we weer een hoop nieuwe films draaien. Hoor je de Bioscoop Top 5 en neemt Ruudje mee naar het InScience Film Festival. Welkom bij Cinema. Als er nou in een rivier die de grens markeert tussen twee landen een nieuw klein eilandje ontstaat, van wie is dat dan? Over deze moeilijke vraag buigen Georgië en buurland Abghazië zich in de film Corn Island. Het verhaal is gecentreerd rondom een oudere man die graan gaat verbouwen op het vruchtbare nieuwe stukje land. Ze kijken echt wel vreemd op als de troepen aan de kant van de rivier opduiken. Simindis Kunzuli, oftewel Corn Island, wordt door de Georgiërs ingezonden naar de Oscars. Het is een film van weinig woorden, een overpijnzing. De film vertelt vooral met beelden, vol van symboliek. full circle. No explanation I offer will satisfy you. You seek resolutions because you're young. But you will understand this one day. Als kerstfilms je iets willen aanpraten is het wel dat eenzaamheid tijdens kerst het ergste is wat een mens kan overkomen. Tel daarbij een ontluikende lesbische liefde op en je hebt de tranentrekker Carol. New York, 1952 en Carol, een elegante, rijke en getrouwde vrouw, ontmoet op kerstavond de jongere Therese, die verlangt naar een ander leven. Omdat ze allebei alleen zijn met kerstmis, stelt Carol haar voor samen te reizen naar Midden-Amerika. Ze raken verliefd op elkaar en beginnen een relatie. Carol zit echter gevangen in een liefdeloos huwelijk en is bang om de voogdij van haar dochter kwijt te raken bij een echtscheiding. And then it changed. She's still my wife. I love her. Be like this. I know. If he can't have me, I can't see my daughter. The Bioscope Top 5 van deze week. Op 5 vinden we 45 years. So full of history, you see? Like a good marriage. Op 4 de heftige Holocaustfilm Son of Soul. 3 de Nederlandse romcom Ja, ik wil. Daniel Simons. Hey chef. Stel je voor dat jij mijn chef zou noemen. <laughs> Op 2 een schitterende Michael Caine en Harvey Keitel in Youth. En op 1, 007 in Spectre. Living in the shadows. Hunting. Being hunted. Always alone. Shit. 
she better not. It's impossible to break. Pretty handy. I'm a scout. Like an actual scout? Yeah. Nice things. Thanks. You know, tonight's the secret party, right? Everybody except the douchebags and the neckerchiefs will be going. This could be the night of our lives. Het zombie genre is populairder dan ooit. De levende doden vinden in Scout's Guide to the Zombie Apocalypse hun tegenstanders in, jawel, een scoutingclubje. Op de vooravond van hun laatste kampeertrip ontdekken drie scouts de werkelijke betekenis van vriendschap als ze hun thuisstadje proberen te redden van een zombie-uitbraak. Of het de drie jonge padvinders zou lukken de zombies tot stoppen te dwingen, valt nog te bezien. You are cinema. How many times have we interviewed a writer in the last 10 years? Because Rolling Stone doesn't interview writers. There hasn't been a writer like this. He's finishing up a book tour. I want to go with him. Did you see Kern's review in New York Magazine? The guy's been canonized. Sorry, who's this? David Foster Wallace. There better be a story there. Wie had dat nou gedacht? Dat Jason Siegel een serieuze rol in zich had? Nou ja, zo verbazend is het misschien nou ook weer niet. Deze week schittert hij als schrijver David Foster Wallace in The End of the Tour. De depressieve auteur van Infinite Jazz wordt in deze film geïnterviewd door Rolling Stone journalist David Lipsky. En deze David wordt dan weer gespeeld door Jesse Eisenberg. Het befaamde vijf dagen durende interview van twaalf jaar voor de zelfmoord van Wallace Plaats. Regisseur James Ponsold maakte hiervoor het geprezen The Spectacular Now en zet zich nu definitief op de kaart. Inmiddels werkt hij aan een verfilming van de literaire hit The Circle. Maar eerst kunnen we nog hiervan genieten. What are you doing? I saw you hitting on Betsy. Of course I was not flirting. He just he went completely crazy on me. You're compulsively flirtatious. Okay. Well, now you're taking his son. You're like a nervous guy, huh? Alex, <laughs> I'm terrified. You're not alone in this. Let's do this together. <laughs> no, no, no. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Welcome op het gloednieuwe In Science Film Festival in Nijmegen. Het is natuurlijk al achter de rug, want het was afgelopen 4 tot met 8 november. Maar we gaan er even vandaag extra aandacht aan besteden. We beginnen met de publieksopening, waar de film te zien was, de Stanford Prison Experiment. En een van de mensen die eraan bezig was, was de scriptschrijver, Tim Talbot. Would you rather be a guard or a prisoner? I don't think I have the qualities to be a guard. Prisoner. Prisoner, I guess. Prisoner. Sounds like it would be OS work. Prisoner. My first draft of the script was almost 300 pages long, but it pretty much dictated almost everything of note that happened in those six days. And um, at the time, we had another director that was involved, and I handed him this telephone book page script and just said, I think they're going to fire me, but, you know, here's what happened. And he read it and came back to me and said, you know, this is great. This is, this is, a, this is what we're going to make. But we can't show this script to anyone because they'll never read it. So over the course of the next 10 days, we ended up cutting 100 and, almost 180 pages out of the script. Basically, at the end of the day, hopefully we, when audiences watch the film, we hope that you think, oh my God, I can't believe that people can actually behave this way. And then also, I wonder what I would have done. I would have, if, if I had been a prisoner or if I had been a guard, would I have been you know, a complacent prisoner or a guard that looked the other way while other people were abusive? And to me, that's like the big hopefully take away of the movie. Because you didn't believe anything, you, you said you didn't buy it? Yeah, when, when they first approached me about writing this script, um, and I just heard the, the, the quick pitch, I said, I don't believe this. I don't believe there's any way you can take a normal, healthy human being and in three or four days make them believe that a hallway and three cr classrooms is a prison they can't get out of. But then once I started doing the research and realized, oh, wow, these, these guys are brainwashing them. And they're using repetition and dehumanization techniques to really 
break these kids psychologically. And, and, you know, there really was the only one incident of violence, which is in the film. Otherwise, no one was, was physically hurt at all. It was all just abusive, repetitive. I mean, in the reality of this thing, it was going on 24 hours a day. Um, well, my question is, um, the prisoners were actually given uh, opportunities to, to back out, sort of, uh, especially during the interviews with their, their own relatives and also the prisoners who were released. And none of them seemed to really take the action required when they could to get themselves out of the experiment. So I was wondering what you think that is. Um, when they were there, and it's, it's in the film, while they were there, the guards are walking around the entire time. So no one felt comfortable enough to say anything to their relatives, like that things were going badly, um, because there was always a guard within earshot, and they were afraid of the repercussions if it got back to them. And one of the, the great details that, that Zimbardo told me about that didn't make it into the film, fortunately, unfortunately, was that um, Zimbardo created an environment during visiting day where the visitors were sort of angry at the people that they were coming to visit because he made them wait in a waiting room for an hour and a half and blamed it on the fact that the prisoners were having a second dessert, you know? And so a lot of these people had driven for like an hour and a half to get there for this thing, and then they were told, oh, you can only visit for 15 minutes because they took up too much of their time. You did talk to uh, Dr. Zimbardo several times to, to ask him about what happened in these days? Yes, um, very early on, I started an email correspondence with him, um, and he was writing his book about this at the same time that I was writing the script. So he would send me chapters of his book as I'm writing you know, the same thing for the, for the movie. Um, and it was to the point that I had so much of his research materials with me that I actually had to correct him on a couple of things, you know, <laughs> that literally, I, there was a point in time where I knew more about this than I think anybody on the planet, including Phil, for about a day maybe. In which ways does this differ from your previous job of writing for South Park? I would say it's exactly the same, you know, except I didn't have a room full of really funny people to bounce this idea off with. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, there, there is a bit of humor in the beginning of the movie, and I think that's important. As a, as a writer, I've found that the, the best way, whether it's in a horror movie or a comedy or any kind of film, really, to get your audience on board with a character is to give them an interesting sense of humor. So the fact that there's a, the joking that's going on in the first day and stuff makes you kind of like those guys and, 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 want, and empathize with them when shit starts to go down downhill. Um, so yeah, you know, it's just, in terms of writing, it's a different muscle, uh, you know, but I can tell you while I was writing this, sometimes when I get into the very deep, dark, because there's darker stuff happened during this than, than even made it into the film, um, I would often have to release the valve and write something silly into the script and then cut it out <laughs> because... You I actually mean, did that? Yeah, yeah, I do that all the time um, because, especially with the, the darker material it, it sometimes you got it and you know when we were shooting it the same thing the actors had to do the same thing where they'd get through a take and then they'd break and they'd start making each other laugh because it was just so heavy fine Avold. thank you a festival is niet compleet zonder heel veel leuke dingen om te doen dus daarom eerst even nog een kleine sfeerimpressie basically a film about a subject that no one knows anything about really so it was uh, really not just looking at trying to explain this mysterious organism and its curious behavior but also to look at uh, people who become obsessed with you know studying this this whole scientific process and the, the creative process both from artists uh, from an artistic point of view and a scientific point of view and I think we wanted to show that science and arts actually are not diametrically opposed. There is quite a lot of relationship between them. The type of uh, research that we were focusing on the film is all very recent. It's all basically after 2000 when uh, Japanese researcher uh, Toshiyuki Nagagaki discovered that you can 
get a, a slime mold to go through a maze and it will always find the shortest path to get to its food. Yeah. So that made me think, oh, there's actually some interesting stuff here. Let's go and uh, pursue this. How hard was it for you to like get into the idea that this, this slime mold might be this intelligent? Tim actually says an interesting thing, because we get asked a lot about what do we think is a slime mold intelligent or not. And uh, Tim is actually an animator as well as a filmmaker, so he always talks about the slime molds as being an animation material. It's something that you, you, know, you film in time lapse and you can control it um, by coaxing it into forming various patterns with oat flakes. So it's like an animation medium. And I was thinking about that um, term animation, it means, you know, anima, giving, a, giving something a soul, giving a, an inanimate object a, a soul or this idea of like the, a life behind it. So I think that's what we were trying to do, to, to show this thing actually has, there might be some primeval intelligence lurking in the universe that we don't know about, but we don't say it's intelligent. And when did you realize it was like cinematic? I think from the very beginning, because we knew that there isn't really a tradition of independent uh, science filmmaking. So, you know, the, in the UK, we have the BBC do a lot of TV documentaries, TV science. Yeah. Um, but, but outside of TV, you don't get a lot. And I don't like the TV approach because I don't like, I find it quite patronizing. It always is too over explanatory. And, you know, it's presenter led, uh, it's very dialogue heavy. And all of these things we consciously rejected. So that's why we said, you know, we're not going to do it in a TV ratio. We're going to do it in widescreen. We're going to make it look beautiful. We've got all the material we need here in the UK. We've got the forests. We've got the, the slime molds. And um, we knew that slime molds were very visual, the way they move, you know, in time lapse. Uh, so we, yeah, we, we thought long and hard about how we were going to make the film look and, and uh, you know, came across this, this idea of making it look like a 70s science fiction movie. So like the Andromeda Strain, Phase yeah. 4, the Hellstrom Chronicle. And now you're here, so it's definitely paid off. Yeah, well, I don't know if it's paid off, but yeah. in terms of... <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's, it's actually, it had a US theatrical release. Um, so we were in New York about a month ago, it played at Film Forum, and it's done about 15 other cinemas. It's getting a UK DVD Blu-ray release. It's getting a big Netflix release. So it will pay off in the future, and, and it's found audiences. It's, and uh, this is what people at the beginning said, you will never get anyone to watch this film, and no one's going to find this interesting. And, and I think we've proven ourselves right. I mean, it's never going to be mass appeal, but, you know. Wie ik ook interviewde was Kim Nguyen, de regisseur van The Empire of Scent. How do you make smell cinematic? That's a very good question. It was one of the... Initially, I uh, was uh, offered this project and I jumped on the idea of traveling around the world and looking at and how smell affects us, but I was quickly... I quickly became scared of, like, how do you talk about smell and make it compelling in a, in a story. So I had to kind of uh, use a, a human that had a yearning and give, give uh, and live the sense of smell through her. And her name was Molly Birnbaum and she's actually a character who lost her sense of smell at a certain point in her life and she talks about her quest for trying to get back that sense. And uh, I guess that was one of the key moments where I was uh, reassured that we could do a film about, about the sense of smell, which we can't, obviously we can't smell in a theater. I did feel that it was something that was important to our lives, but yet couldn't put my finger on it. So that's actually what kind of uh, compelled me to do this film. It was this uh, curiosity about, it feels important, but I don't know exactly why it is. And that's kind of how the smell is, our sense of smell is. It's something that you can't understand on a, on a, an intellectual level, it's more something that's uh, on an emotional level that we understand it. So do you think because it's on an emotional level that makes it work better for film or is it even harder to convey smell through images? I think that uh, everything was tough about conveying on the screen a sense of smell and I think that the only way to give an idea of what of, uh, to talk about smells on an emotional level was to use uh, the characters in our film use their emotion how they react to smells to kind of uh, transpose their emotion transpose this, 
the actual physicality of smelling with the emotionality of the characters reacting to smells. And it's not a scientific film about our mm -hmm. sense of smell, it's more of a a reflection about a sense of smell. It doesn't mean it doesn't uh, intend to be uh, uh, rational in a way. Before this, you've mostly made fiction, even been um, nominated for an Oscar. So, what made you change forms? Uh, well, actually, it's not a switch. It's uh, I, my main uh, my main focus is still on fiction. But this was such a uh, this, this was already like packaged. It was a project that was offered to me, was financed, and I needed to get out of the, strong, the heavy structures of uh, fiction filmmaking, so I just jumped into it. And after making this film, you're um, uh, invited to a science film festival. Does that make you feel like you're being taken more seriously? <laughs> well, uh, that's interesting. I don't know. I don't, I, don't, I don't know if it's relevant for me. I think that, uh, in a way, the most important for me is to, is to not take myself too seriously. I think that in our industry, uh, we tend to uh, take ourselves too seriously. So, and we're not making as good films if we think that we know everything. So uh, it's kind of the other way around for me. And I suspect you get this question a lot nowadays, but what is your favorite smell? My favorite smell? Well, you don't guess, get it that often. Yeah, I guess it's always of uh, of uh, of past women or, or or my girlfriend with uh, that wears the perfume that uh, that goes well on her. I guess that's that's uh, it, it, that's the never-ending thing that I, I uh, that uh, uh, wakes my senses the most. You are cinema. En toen zat het allereerste in Science Film Festival in Nijmegen er alweer op. Nou. Leuk was het in ieder geval. Graag tot volgende week. Voor jullie is hier nog eventjes de Coming Soon trailer van deze week. En dat is Anomalisa en natuurlijk het volledige filmoverzicht. Dus graag tot volgende week. Dikke doei! Wat is het om human? Wat is het om te ache? Wat is het om be alive. Each person you speak to has had a day. Some of the days have been good, some bad. Each person you speak to has had a childhood. Each has a body. Each body has aches. Look for what is special about each individual. Focus on that. Remember, there is someone out there for everyone. I think you're extraordinary. Why? I don't know yet. It's just obvious to me that you are. Our time is limited, we forget that. Sorry, I grabbed your hand. It's okay. It's a reflex. But I don't like to fly. I said it's okay. You can let go now, though.